Hopefully everyone this morning looked west and appreciated the majesty of the Rocky Mountains. Now, some of us like to ski, and so it's easy to take, let's say, a ski lift to go to the top of a mountain. But imagine having to climb some of these mountains. I'm sure many people say, oh, 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 that's a little too intimidating. I'm not going to do it. Well, one of the proudest moments of my priesthood to date has been my participation, or had been, my participation in a program called Angels on High. And so I'll show you the picture of, uh, of one of the scenes. And so Angels on High was a program in which we were trying to fundraise uh, money to build a new Catholic church in Chestermere by climbing mountains. And how it all began was I listened to an idea a mountaineer in our parish had. He said, Father, we should be climbing mountains to fundraise for the church. I said, no way. He said, yeah, sure, we'll do, we'll do it. And so it all began in 2012, in which 12 people decided, okay, we're going to climb Mount Temple. How appropriate if we're going to build the church in Chestermere to, to climb a religiously named mountain, Mount Temple. And it was daunting because we had to do a lot of training beforehand and, uh, and, and to get people to support and pledge us. And so what was very remarkable is that people, when they saw the mountain, said, I'm not going to climb it, but if you show me, I will do it. And so as I mentioned, we had to do training climbs, so progressively more challenging mountain climbs, ultimately culminating in a, in a, in a major climb, I think usually the, uh, the first Saturday of August. And so we climbed, as I mentioned, Mount Temple in 2012. We climbed uh, Mount Allen's Centennial Ridge in 2013. The scene from Castle Mountain in, in 2015. And last, we climbed Mount Chester. How appropriate to build the church in Chester Mere by climbing Mount Chester. And so every year got larger and larger. So as I mentioned, the first year got 12 people. The following year, we had 18. This image has 27. And last year was 35. Now, for those, again, who have ever climbed mountains, it is tough. And all the mountains we did were very substantial, over 3,000 meters. And we were not always the most uh, fit, eclectic bunch to go there. In fact, we were very eclectic. But because of the training, and even on the day of the mountain climb, when people said, I'm tired, I'm scared, or suffering from acrophobia, fear of heights. So we had to listen to each other. And say, okay, come on, let's do it. You can do it. I'll, I'll, I'll take your bag. I'll wait for you. And all these remnants of, um, of hope in the midst of the great challenge of climbing these substantial mountains. Sometimes it would be 10, 12-hour days of climbing and in the burning heat of the sun. Not only in the, my four years of participating in this program did we raise $250,000, but also, ultimately it was building up our community. Is that we were taking the challenge to climb these mountains, and people got to know each other by virtue of almost the suffering to enter more deeply into glory. And so because I listened to that mountaineer's idea of, hey, let's climb mountains in order to build our new church in Chestermere, and listening to the needs of our, of our people climbing these substantial mountains, we were in a certain sense glorified, encountering God on the holy mountains. Likewise with us. We are transfigured when we listen to Jesus. So not only do the mountains for us as, as Calgarians inspire us, but in fact all religions have an affinity for mountains. And of course in the scriptures, there are 500 references to mountains in the scriptures because physically they're close to God. If we believe that God is in the heavens, well the mountains are pretty close to the mountains. And not everybody can go there because it takes a great deal of effort to go to the mountain. So when one goes to the mountaintop, it is a sacrifice of time and talent to get up the mountain and there's a place to encounter the beauty and the majesty looking down. Well, even Jesus in the, in the Gospel of Matthew goes to the mountains many times. One of his, uh, when he is tempted, he's on the top of a mountain. Of course, the famous Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, that there are two occasions. So next week, we hear about Jesus being on a mountain to pray, and then he walks in the water to calm the storm. He also does healings after he is on the mountain in chapter 15. Matthew 17, we, of course, we have the great uh, transfiguration. His last discourse takes place on the Mount of Olives in Matthew 25, 
and the uh, commissioning of the apostles after his resurrection, Matthew 28, of course, happens on a mountain. So mountains have a great deal to play with, with the life of God in terms of kind of solitude and his closeness with his father. I think today as we celebrate the transfiguration may be the most glorious occasion in his public ministry of being on a mountain. And so he takes with him uh, Peter, James, and John. It seems to be his closest apostles to be with him. Now, had we read the very first part of chapter or verse one, it would have said that six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. Well, what happened six days before? I'll keep in suspense. No, I'll tell you. So Jesus uh, receives Peter's confession of faith. Jesus asks Peter, who do people say that I am? And so this is common in both Matthew, Mark, and Luke's gospel. Then he tells them of his first uh, proclamation of his passion. And after that, he will tell them the conditions of discipleship. He will say, unless you become my followers, you cannot become my disciples. You must take up your cross and follow me. Those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Whoa, that's pretty heart-wrenching. That's a remarkable sacrifice. Shouldn't it be easy to follow our Lord? Well, like climbing mountains is not so easy. And so to give his uh, intimate friends a, a glimpse of his glory, to really to say, I'm in charge. I'm going to make all things new. He brings them up to what's termed Mount Tabor and reveals his divinity, cloaked in his humanity. So it's not only to inspire Peter, James, and John to follow him, but it's also a reminder that Jesus is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies. And no two figures would be more suitable for that than both Moses and Elijah. Moses, the great giver of the covenant on Mount Sinai, and also on Mount Horeb, which is also called Mount Sinai, Elijah, the great prophet, encounters our Lord. And so on both occasions, they encountered a theophany, of presence of God on a mountain. And so Jesus, uh, the fulfillment of all the promises in which both Moses and Elijah bring forward, it's not so much bringing a new covenant or a new, as Moses did, or even Elijah, that he was to bring Israel back to following our Lord, following the covenant, and purifying the religious observance. But here Jesus is the fulfillment of all that. He is the new covenant, the new and everlasting covenant, as we hear in our Eucharistic prayer. And ultimately that he shows us how to worship in spirit, in truth. What, what Elijah had done um, to bring renewal to the people. And how it concludes the visit is the Father speaks. In the same way that he spoke to the, um, to the disciples when Jesus himself was baptized, this is my beloved Son. In the baptism a proclamation whom, with whom I'm well pleased. And what about today, the transfiguration? What does Jesus say? Listen to him. In the sense of that Jesus, even though they're, they're so transfixed by the transfiguration. And Peter says, let's build three tents. Let's enjoy this moment. But it's really listening to what's going to happen, that Jesus will lay down his life, that he will uh, lose his life so that all people may encounter his salvation. So listening to Jesus. And so if we listen to Jesus, we will be transfigured. And I think our, our, the whole of our Christian lives is one of kind of ascending the mountain. And as I mentioned with the, our Angels on High campaign at St. Gabriel's and Chestermere, it was tough. But we were very pleased to be on the mountaintop. And in this very special way, each one of us by virtue of baptism is, is to encounter the glory of God. And today we have six children who will be baptized today. And I think it's, it's one of, of great joy. So it's only a great privilege, but I would even say it's a great responsibility, this call to baptism, that throughout the scriptures, when, when Peter speaks and, and Paul speak about baptism, it's we are plunged into Christ's life. If we have died with Christ, we will also rise with him. And so to heed the, the, the words of, of the Father, this is my beloved son, this is my beloved daughter with whom I'm well pleased, well, it's ultimately to listen to our Lord. And so it's easy to listen to the Lord when things go well. Hey, when, we're, when it's a beautiful day as it is today, we're surrounded by friends and family, things are happy. 
But what about when the cross comes? Unless you take up your cross and follow me, you have no life. And so there are many times in life when people say, I don't want to listen to God. If this is how he's going to treat me, no. But I beg you to reflect upon my experience of four years on Angels on High, that every year more and more people came because they heard the good news. Okay, the suffering, the pain, the anxiety of getting so high up, but it was so glorious to be together to encounter the Lord on the mountaintop. I think likewise for these children, that often people think of baptism as a one and done. I got my kid done. No. It's a one and begun. Now we're entering the beginnings of a new life in which we all uh, heed the, the voice of our Lord to listen to him and follow him as his disciples. And it's not easy. Whoa. And I think when people are together to, uh, to be strengthened in this call, more people want to join. And that's why these children have not only their parents to support them on this spiritual life, but ultimately their godparents and all the friends and family to encourage them. So when things get tough, it's all a part of going to this great mountain of our Lord, the great summit of his glory, which is heaven. And so we have to go there together to encourage one another when things don't go well. And really, not only is baptism a revealing of divine life, but all the sacraments are moments of transfiguration. Just as Jesus himself, after he predicted his, his, uh, his, uh, the passion for the first time, they thought, how is this going to be? You're so ordinary. And yet the transfiguration reveals his glory. But all the sacraments do that. Just as baptism, okay, it's water and oil, okay. But they reveal somehow God's glory, and especially the Eucharist. Bread and wine, what are they? But when we ask the Holy Spirit to come down upon these gifts, they become his body, the Lord's body and blood. What a miracle. And that should in turn inspire us to be glad to associate ourselves with our Lord, to be his disciples, and in turn to share this good news with those people who don't want to listen anymore, who said this life of, of Christ is too difficult. No, but I think, I think we have to all be together because we're all ascending together to this great mountain and we have to listen to the Lord. And so to all to be people of faith, especially to celebrate the Eucharist, hey, these, this is the moment of transfiguration. It is good for us to be here and then in turn to come down from this great mountain of our faith to, to encourage others to listen to our Lord and in turn to be transfigured. So part of my job as a priest is to listen a lot. And so when I listened to this mountaineer saying, hey, let's climb mountains to help build a church in Chestermere, I thought, that's crazy, but we'll give it a try. And remarkably, to encounter the, the glories of God's creation in these mountains, it was a remarkable inspiration that all the hard work had meaning because we're going to encounter God on the top of a mountain and rejoice in that. And the fact that every year more and more people wanted to be part of this journey which necessarily takes a lot of effort, but there is great glory in it. And I think likewise for us is by virtue of baptism, we are beloved sons and daughters, and we must become his disciples to live out the Paschal mystery of our Lord, to suffer like him, to die like him, but ultimately to rise with him on the last day. And so let's rejoice that, that we have an opportunity to listen to our Lord. And by listening to our Lord, we become transfigured. And so let's share this glory with the many people in our world who need to hear it. So if we listen to Jesus, we will be transfigured.